Well, good afternoon, and welcome to this presentation. Where did that come from? Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for the organizers and to the HTA for giving me this opportunity to come today. I feel very privileged about talking here because this is one of my life's passions. Ever since childhood, I've always asked the question, and my father always used to dread it, where does that come from? How is that made? So I hope some of the passion is triggered off with yourselves. My name is Charles Drew, and I'm founder and partner at New Leaf Sustainability Practice. We specialize in providing sustainability and responsible sourcing practice for a range of retail, corporate, trade organizations, and NGOs across the UK. Now, I've been involved in horticulture since the 15, when I used to work at Whitehall Garden Centre near Wiltshire as a car park attendant. And following studying at Rissell with commercial horticulture, I then went on to become production managers at some well-known companies such as Hilliers and Valleybrook in Canada. Then, on returning back to the UK, I noticed that when working for some of the major retailers, we started to realize that we needed to tackle head-on some of the environmental and ethical impacts of our supply chains. Now, this nearly got me shot in the jungles of Borneo. I've been stuck in the middle of peat bogs in Europe and lost tracing materials on the Russian-North Korean border. I've seen factories empty in seconds due to government officials coming in, as most of the staff were illegal immigrants. And I've also seen people standing in toxic chemicals. Now, some of these experiences have enabled me to use my knowledge to support business, trade networks, the government departments, and numerous working groups on the UK on issues such as illegal timber, quarrying of stone, through to blood diamonds and dirty gold. Now, these issues affect all sectors, especially the horticultural industry. The HDA are keen to support their members in avoiding some of the risks that I'm about to talk to you about. They also want to help their members make the most of the opportunities that this also exists. So after conversations with the HTA, we're delighted to launch the HTA's new advice line, Sustainability and Responsible Sourcing. Now today, I'm going to try and start off with some of the global issues and be very quite short on this, and explain some of the environmental impacts and ethical issues that we face. I'm going to try to take some of the myth take the myth out of the word sustainability and surprise you with how much you're already doing. And I'm also going to highlight where you need to do more, specifically around the sourcing of responsible products and the support that New Leaf and through the HGA we can provide. Now, unlike most of the sustainability presentations that you've seen, we hope that you will leave with even just a few good ideas that you can take away to your own business. So, why should we be interested in all of this? Let's talk about some of the things that are happening, and I'm going to highlight four issues. Ethics, and this is how supply chains treat people. This graph from STR, one of the world's largest audit and ethical testing companies, has summarized all their audit findings in the year 2010. And this tells us, out of some of the audits, that 5% have child issues, 16% of audits find excessive working hours, and 16% have poor pay. But actually, what is the most concerning and alarming is if you add the two big columns, over 50% have health and safety issues, all of which can be straightforward and easily addressed. Now, climate change, much has been said about this. It's often extremely difficult to penetrate due to the science and politics behind it. But actually, as humans, we can observe changes all around us. And this is one of my favorite slides and observations. But other people are making observations too. Recently, I was fortunate enough to have met Ben Saunders, the polar explorer. And what struck me about his story of his journeys to the North Pole was often he spent more time going backwards than forwards due to the change in ice flows. He also spent more time swimming between the ice gaps than he did five years ago and he also doubts that this journey will never be repeated in the next 10 years. But for the garden industry, what is climate change? Well, it's more than carbon and fossil fuels in your operations. It's also about water scarcity, flooding, unpredictable weather, and a change in your customers' needs. 
Now, loss of habitat. The example I'm going to give is one that's dearest to my heart, deforestation. Much has been done to stop the most rampant deforestation in the tropics, but it's still happening at an alarming rate. Forests are being converted to monoculture plantations for pulp and oil, with the resulting massive loss in biodiversity, causing population shifts and the reduced ability of the planet to regulate CO2 in the environment. Quality of environment. And as with thousands of others, we followed David Walliams on his journey the other week and chose this slide to aptly demonstrate, unfortunately, that it's legal to pollute. Of concern, it's not necessarily what we can see, and I'm certainly glad I didn't see what David Williams saw in the Thames, but it's what we can't. It's the chemicals that leach into the watercourses, it's the effluent from industrial and residential systems that are all having an impact on the health of our environment. So those are some of the, the broad issues. So what would the role of horticulture be in a more sustainable world? Let's quickly have a look at some of the things that we're already doing. Firstly, buying British and buying local. A recent witch survey showed us that 58% of customers prefer to buy British plants, and 66% prefer to buy locally sourced plants, and even the raw couple are doing it. And as a result, their buying decisions, UK horticulture was beamed to millions around the world. Now, UK horticulture is also known for being highly innovative. Walking around today, I've already seen so many new ideas, from promising peat-free alternatives, through to the use of biocompostable products, water retention, through to an ever-use of recycled materials in our garden. And also, our innovation will also be further showcased by the Olympic Games, where we can talk of our work on wetland restoration, sourcing of native plants, and the ecological perennial planting that substitute, uh, and substrates, which have all been recycled on site. Thirdly, horticulture plays a huge role in healthier lifestyles, as we've already heard. It gets people outdoors through exercise, understanding and working with natural processes. It plays a role in the community. It's an opportunity for different generations to come together, allowing us to learn the lessons from the past. And wildlife. 86% of households have gardens, and they're becoming more and more important to the survival of many species that use them as habitats and wildlife corridors to move through. Now, we actually have several beehives at home. My father-in-law remembers the days when he used to have the hide in the center of the town, and they used to collect more nectar due to the mass of plants in his locality compared to the arable fields where we live. And for all the talk of adopting more sustainable practices, who should be at the top of the list? Gardeners. The best ones compost, they recycle, they produce their own food, and they also manage their own water. But the thing that strikes me the most is that when we talk about sustainability in gardening, there's a common thread that runs through both. And the focus is on the future. Why else would we toil with plants and seeds and bulbs if it was not anticipation of the first signs of spring or next year's crop? So with the changing mood of our times, the horticultural industry has a massive opportunity, both to ride the wave and also to ensure it recognizes and is accountable for its activities. The trade has already done a lot. The GMI has started to address the extremely complex and often emotional subject of peat and the government's 2020 targets. But we have a huge amount more to do. We've talked about some of the global issues, and also we've talked about horticulture, how it can contribute to sustainability. But as individual businesses, why is this important to you? Well, there's just five things I'd like to highlight to you. The first is a risk to your brand. As this happens in other sectors, NGOs and consumer groups are now beginning to focus on the sector. Ethical Consumer gave a sustainability score for garden centers based on the range of indicators, and the highest scored 10 out of 20, showing that there's a lot more that we can do. The second, is what other sectors are doing, who have already started to address their key issues. You know, we're way behind them, and that this leaves us quite exposed. The third, legislation. 
more of this is coming more relevant to the garden industry. The REACH and, of course, the forthcoming timber regulations will all have a major impact on the way we do business and on the products we sell. And the fourth is the customer expectation of you operating responsibly. This in the future will be key for ensuring customer loyalty and a full car park. Their demand for responsible business and products is growing. According to an IEMA publication in July, B&Q increased its sales of independently verified eco products by 1.1 billion. And now this operates at a level of 11% of their total turnover. Demand is growing. And one, and the lastly, it's going to be one of simple resource and labor availability. We currently use three times more resources than this planet has. So what sort of future would that look like if we continue to use it as we do? Now, the future is in our hands. We can shape what it looks like or wait until the consequences of our actions of today are forced upon us. And that is why responsible sourcing is so important, because it's in our capability to change. So let's have a focus on responsible sourcing. And what does it look like? Well, it's about knowing your product story, knowing where the raw materials came from, how it's manufactured and by who, the impacts of who uses it and how it's used, and then how it's recycled and obviously disposed of. And I'm using Patagonia Clothing Company as an example to illustrate what a product story means. The map here illustrates where the raw materials came from and the journey that this T-shirt has made through its manufacture to point of sale and, of course, the impacts on its way. Now, Patagonia know this because they've asked the question of their suppliers and they understand the standards that they need to achieve. But many other organizations are doing just this. We've already heard today that using new technology and barcoding, often you could have all this information at the customer's fingertips. But all the customers, all the companies had to start somewhere. They face often thousands of products of potential issues, but they all started with the question, what's in my product? Where did it come from? And how was it made? So I thought you might find it interesting if we hear about the journeys of a couple of brands and products that we're all very familiar with. So let's be British and let's have a cup of tea. Today, we drink PG tips in the full knowledge that we're consuming a responsibly sourced product. But this, however, has not always been the case with tea. The Kenyan tea industry was exposed to the news of low wages, which resulted in workers supplementing their wage in the sex industry. There are also issues of child labor and deforestation. And forests were being cut down and burnt to dry the leaves. And this further continued the cycle, of forest loss and soil erosion. But big changes happened over the last three years, a result of consumer demand, NGO exposure, and the increasing importance of responsibility to brand reputation. Now, the industry has started to change, address these issues. Workers are guaranteed a fair wage. Health and safety issues are now being addressed. And of course, PG Tips are proud to tell their story and, and along with other brands, have achieved certification of their plantations through Rainforest Alliance. Another story, the toilet roll. Now, Kimberly Clark found that their production of toilet rolls led to the destruction of ain't foreign forest in Canada. And Greenpeace were key in exposing this. They maintained Kim the pressure over Kimberly Clark for over five years as a campaign in order to protect this, a pristine and wildness. Now, Kimberly Clark responded, and efforts responded in this responsible product, again certified by the FSC. They have taken this work and extended it into other product groups. Now, Kimberly Clark support FSC and recycled tissue products and play an active role in responsible sourcing of forest products. So we have just mentioned just two stories, but where do you start if you probably buy hundreds and thousands of products, many of which are proprietary? Well, as we've discussed, there are, oops, there are many products out there that have independently certified schemes. 
But what you can do is buy more of these and promote them positively with your customers. And you'll be surprised once you start looking at just how many of these products you have in your business. But the challenge comes when you're looking at product stocks, uh, stocking products that are not subject to certification. And this is where the risks and also the opportunities lie in making a difference. But also, this is where you need to be curious. And to help you, we've actually developed our new guide, the Responsible Sourcing Guide for Garden Retailers. Now, this guide has been broken down into nine sections or product groups, where each section is further broken down to give you an overview of the key issues, what are the key concerns that you need to be aware of, listing some of the products you actually may have in your garden centers or businesses that are affected, and then, of course, practical examples of next steps what to buy more of, what to buy less of, where to go for more information, but also how to work with your suppliers so that they can provide you with the right stories so that you can demonstrate to your customers your responsibility. And it's also a good point for me to say that we've also developed a simple but effective eight-step guide on how to reduce the impact Pete has on your business. And obviously, at the end of the, this guide, it could potentially lead to GMI membership. And I'm also pleased to announce that another 130 garden centers have already gone through the application route, and we're looking forward to their membership through the garden center group. And of course, while we're on the subject of Pete, support is also at hand through a new and exciting RAP project where training on Pete and Pete alternatives is available for 20 garden centers, and also via an application process, a more intensive one-to-one -one support for 10 committed retailers and garden centers in supporting them to reduce their peat within their business. But back to the responsible sourcing guide. These are the categories that it covers, and hopefully the guide will take you through timber and how to identify your biggest impacts, whether it's indoor, outdoor garden furniture, through to paper and tissue. Chemicals, and what you should know about some of the innocent-looking products that you sell. PEAT, and what support, support is available to meet government targets. Stone, and the life of those employed in the supply it to you, and the issues also within our own shores. Plastics, and the confusion over how we should dispose of them, and actually what nasty chemicals they may contain. Cotton, includes the good, the bad, and also the ugly. And sourcing from the wild, and things that are not ours to take. But also important is imported products, whose stories are rarely told, but now should be. And finally, we've included a section on advertising and marketing to ensure that our stories avoid greenwash, and that are all clear, accurate, and substantiated. Now, sustainability and responsible sourcing is a huge area, and one that not often everybody is familiar with. So that I hope you've helped. Um, it's been interest to you, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And hopefully, with Garden Centre members, also you've enjoyed taking away something that you can use in your garden centre. Now, I've been fortunate enough to work with Eden Project down in Cornwall, and one of their major aims was at the end of every visit they wanted to have seeded an idea or help the visitor do something meaningful in the environment. Well, hopefully through the guide you can download off the HTA website, you'll be able to take something home with you and also do something within your business. And also I'd like to remind you of the new HTA advice line that support for you on this journey. Thank you very much. <laughs>